Brian Shields. Uh, I work at the University of Colorado Cancer Center in Denver. Um, I'm an industrial engineer by background, so I do process improvement for the Cancer Center and really was you know, the project manager for the work that we've been doing in the Infusion Center. Um, uh, just to give you a little bit of context about how, how and where we apply this. This is part of UC Health uh, Academic Medical Center, um, NCI and NCCN designated at our COPE certification. Uh, the infusion center that we apply this to uh, supports our medical oncology uh, subspecialty clinics, of which there are eight-ish. Um, and I find that uh, we have 34 total treatment locations in the infusion center. And keep in mind that this does not include our BMT program, who has a separate infusion area but, uh, that wasn't in scope for what we did originally. Um, so, the context of the infusion center. So the past couple of years, we've seen tremendous growth, double-digit growth, um, as a lot of you probably have as well. That, that kind of translates to roughly 75 patients per day. Um, although on a Wednesday, that's more like 90, and on a Monday or Friday, it's more like 60, perhaps. So again, that's why the templates need to be different, because our clinic volume is going to drive infusion volumes, and so there's a really fast difference by day of the week. Um, but that's roughly the, the volume of treatments that we're providing on a daily basis. Um, and then in terms of how we schedule, we have historically used a centralized scheduler. So our infusion scheduler uh, receives all requests for appointment, and they're the ones that are dictating uh, the schedule for infusion. So that one person basically, uh, <coughs> their, best in, their efforts and attention were the ones responsible for the big spike that we saw every day from 10 to 2. So no. they they weren't like a PhD kind of No. But even if they were, they probably would have failed anyway. So we're really not setting them up for success. Um, and that really led to kind of the, the peak, right? The, the, the triangle. And, and that in particular for us really led to uh, very intense staff dissatisfaction. Our nurses were just burnt out. And it was really that feast or famine mentality where they're not getting lunch and they're just very, very uh, chaotic experience. Um, it, it actually got so bad that right before we went live with this, I, I sat down in one of their staff meetings where they were commenting about the, the state of affairs. Um, and they were they were really just expressing how unsafe they felt and how uncomfortable they felt. In fact, one of the nurses literally said that you know, every day she wakes up and wonders whether or not today's the day she's going and that's obviously not a good place to be. And, and, and this is one of the rare uh, instances where I heard some fairly negative feedback about the state of affairs where we actually had something, a project, a solution in mind that's going to have a big impact, hopefully, on uh, resolving that for the concern. So um, it was kind of a good timing, um, it was pure luck. Uh, but, but that's really how bad it's gotten. They were just really uncomfortable. Schedule. Um, along with that, with our increased growth, we were very concerned about taking advantage of un underutilized capacity in the mornings and the afternoons. Uh, we had already done physical expansion of the, the infusion center, so we added more chairs and uh, rooms, um, and also expanded to the weekend, so Saturday, Sunday, and um, But we needed to take advantage of the capacity. So, from a timeline standpoint, uh, we did our analysis preparation in uh, July and August. And really what that involved was the full data, uh, A, gathering the data for the test to analyze and uh, generate the optimal uh, templates, uh, and B, making the, so we use EPIC um, for our EMR, EPIC and Beacon. Uh, so making the changes in, the, in EPIC to facilitate that, which really revolved or involved um, creating five new visit types so one visit type for each of the buckets. So infusion, no chair, meaning like an injection or something along those lines. Um, zero to one, one to two, two to three, three to five, and five plus hours were the buckets that we ended up using. Uh, but we needed to create specific visit types in Epic to match for those. And then we needed to plug in uh, templates and cadence uh, that match the, the optimal schedule that we need to provide. <coughs> So that was all done by August. Our first template went live uh, September 1st. Uh, 
uh, it, we, we booked out in the Infusion Center about six weeks, so it took about a six week uh, transition to go from the old template to the new. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, and then we did a, a total refresh in version two of our templates here at the, the start of this one. So it's kind of early for us in terms of results, but um, that's uh, kind of our experience so far. Um, in terms of what went well, so this is something that really doesn't ever end, right? So we analyzed the data, uh, put together the optimal template, um, but since then we've been revising it and tweaking it because it wasn't quite right to be um, had some data issues up front. That led to, the tweaking led to version two, which just happened. Um, but the, the short of the long there is that all that refinement has really kind of helped us hit that sweet spot. So before, we would run out of chairs a lot. Right? And as long as I talk about this, it's a really bad thing. I think the rights were all the patients are waiting. Um, now we very rarely do that. And if we do that, it's for a much, much shorter duration. So it's 10 maybe 15 minutes tops now. Uh, but that, the, the refinement really is uh, paid off for us. Uh, secondarily, what went well, the, our Epic workflow literally did not change whatsoever throughout this whole process. So that, from a training standpoint and implement, implementation <coughs> standpoint, it's fantastic that they're literally clicking the same exact buttons that they do. But now we have a template built in Epic that lets them do the right thing. Right? So it makes it easy to do opposed to just, you know, again, just guessing at that moment of time when they get the request. So uh, that was great. Um, and then along with the template and the, um, that visibility to doing the right thing, we've implemented daily huddles. Um, we, we have a tool that basically allows us to kind of capture some data. And the whole idea of the huddles uh, really is to be proactive about the day and to create operational awareness of potential issues throughout the day. So we get a feed um, that shows you know, what that what the what the chart looks like for that given day based on what has been scheduled as of yesterday. So it's not exactly accurate, but we know roughly that our busy time is going to be from one to one thirty, for example. So that then we can tell the whole staff if we get a request for an add-on patient, not to do it at one fifteen, right? So we can kind of guide those add-on patients to a less utilized point in time during the day. Um, it also allows us to just have a general conversation around uh, any sick calls or meetings or you know get those kind of things. So we're capturing all that in, in kind of a huddle tool that lets us uh, really understand how our day is going to look, how it looks. Um, we also get um, feedback around how yesterday went. So the same chart of where things uh, were busy. In terms of uh, lessons learned and what could have went better, I'm sure. Every, I know as a process of group members, and that every project has lessons, right? And you're not paying attention to those if you're missing out. But uh, some of the things that we've uh, kind of struggled with is first and foremost, obtaining the right data that we need has been extremely difficult. Uh, Epic is kind of data rich, but information poor. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff, but getting the right stuff has been kind of tricky. Fortunate to have the support of our CIO directly involved in this to help kind of prioritize some of the requests that we've had, but um, it's been really hard. Um, in, in addition, some of the, the timestamps that we're using are manually entered, so you have to be really thoughtful about understanding things. And if people don't do the same thing at the same time every time, that manually entered data point is unreliable. So we have data capture. Yeah, so we've really had to kind of flush through that and. and there really isn't a lot of uh, institutional expertise to say, oh, that data, that data stamp is good, or that one's bad, or here's what this means. It, it might be called X, but it really means Y. So that, that's been a challenge for us. Um, I mentioned the transition from the old, old schedule to the new. Um, we made uh, what turned out to be a fairly poor decision. Uh, so we got the, the shiny new optimized template, and we're very anxious to uh, get that going. But we didn't want to, so we made the decision not to reschedule existing appointments to the new template. So we didn't reschedule, but we didn't also didn't wait until a point in time when the schedule was clear. So we, we scheduled about six weeks out. So the choice was we can wait six weeks to a completely clear point in time and then start with the new schedule. We didn't do that. We said, all right, let's just 
take the existing ones and schedule on top of that, and that, that was not smart. So uh, it was a little painful there for a while. Um, it took us about six weeks to kind of bleed through. Um, so I wouldn't recommend uh, doing that. So you, you would recommend rescheduling everybody in the new time? No. No, I, I would recommend just start picking that point in time where your, your schedule is clear and then scheduling into that. So for version two for us, we said January <coughs> first of this month, right? But we, we, we put the new template into place for January 1st, and then the six weeks leading up to that. So you could either look forward and pick a day when the templates are low, yeah. or you could say, between now and that date, there are some pre-existing appointments. Let me treat those as constraints, so don't mess those up. Then optimize and do the best you can around that. It may not be the best optimal answer, but often it's a better answer to just treat those as constraints and navigate your way to that. When you have a patient with a um, six infusion uh, or do you schedule all six at the same time or do you schedule one and then on exit of that patient schedule weeks we'll, we'll schedule out only six weeks worth out because otherwise things change so much that it doesn't that's kind of our rule of thumb, just not to get it too far out. Um, kind of re relating to number one with the data issue, one of the things that, that we messed up on was uh, not having the right <coughs> visibility to some of our cancellations. So our the version one of our templates actually were built a little bit too high, which was still allowing for the peaks to form. So it got better, but it didn't get much better because we were still seeing peaks and running out of chairs. So, so that was really a, a data issue uh, on our end. And then, and then finally, uh, we, we still struggle with shifting volume to early morning and late afternoon. Um, just because our templates say that we, had, we should be doing that, it's easier said than done. There's, there's, it's just, you can't just flip the switch and make that happen. So. Chris, can you tell us what your hours of operation are? And then um, your nurses, how do you generally schedule them all 8, 10, 12, or sure. sort of mix? Uh, I roughly 7.30 through the end of the day. Uh, the last scheduled uh, appointment will be 4.30, uh, which is based on the pharmacy. Uh, in, in terms of nurse staffing, we uh, we have 10-hour shifts, but it's staggered starts. So we did have to alter the, sta the starts, so the, the length of their shift didn't change, it just the time that they showed up changed. But if you, are, if you have a late patient, that patient's ill or something unexpected happens, they just stay. That's just the way it is. Those nurses. They'll, they'll typically hand off to another nurse who has a much later start. So, do you close your center at a certain time then? Yeah. Um, this two questions. One, um, so are you technically employed by the cancer center or are you part of the university hospital that's? So I, which I'm, I'm reporting as a kind of like reporting. Yeah, so I'm, I'm employed through oncology services. Okay. That's, but I've had a line of processing in group of my hospital system. And then the other thing is that you've got 34 and, and you're on average at about 75 patients, which is interesting because the rule of thumb, right, is when you're playing about two patients per day. On average, you all these things. You're about that, maybe a little higher. Unless it's Wednesday. Unless. You've got many days of cross eating. Yeah, right. And it's, uh, so you're, you're kind of pushing that, right. you know, that, that, I mean, again, from a planning perspective, too, I still think it makes a lot of sense just to control it in general. But you're pushing beyond that a little bit, but it sounds like you're through the time. Absolutely. And that's really why we were interested in this project. We wanted to be proactive about trying to address that because we knew uh, in the middle of the day for sure we're bumping into it that it's not sustainable. So we're still looking at it. But it would certainly work at absolutely. I mean, we made some front end changes. So in terms of uh, impact, if you compare kind of the July, August timeframe to everything after that, uh, we've seen a 7% increase in treatment volume uh, with uh, no negative impact to our wait times. 
uh, or patient satisfaction, which was already really high. Um, so those have definitely not been eroded uh, whatsoever. Uh, our overtime hours went to a 28 percent reduction, and uh, the, the, Mohan talked about the, the water bill squishing and having unintended consequences. So our our balancing metric that we've been looking at is. As things are scheduled, if you look at whatever appointments before the infusion appointment, what is that intra visit duration? And we don't want that to be too long because you could say, oh, we have a perfectly level schedule, but it means that our patients are waiting six hours in between, right? We don't want to do that. So we're, we're measuring how, how long that duration is um, with the idea that, that that shouldn't be getting worse, right? This, the intention is to level up the schedule, but we don't want to have a negative impact. So, that's actually decreased somewhat, which is a good thing. Um, yeah. Do you think that would be um, also the same metrics of outcome compared to September 2014 to mid-January 2015? Like for like? Um, like in terms of just year over year? Yeah, yeah. year over year, same period of time. Sometimes yeah. it's cyclical, right? All sure. Cyclical. Infusion tends not to be. Infusion tends to follow day of week much more than week of year. So Monday in September is much more likely to be like a Monday in August than a Monday in September of a year. So the, the last two are, are purely <coughs> anecdotal and not based on data at this point. Uh, but nursing satisfaction has definitely improved. Um, they, they just feel better, they're getting lunches, etc. <coughs> and then I mentioned before running out of chairs is one of the less frequent and shorter durations. So our next steps will be to continue to monitor this. Like I said, we, you know, this is something that doesn't end. Um, we do a ton of research, so we're always getting new clinical trials. Those trials have you know, different durations, and it has a big impact on us. So depending on what trials uh, come on board, um, will have an impact on our templates. Um, we're also getting more doctors, um, <clears throat> having doctors leave, so that, that all necessitates the need to keep a really close eye on Data that we can adjust the templates as needed. Um, we're still looking at strategies to take advantage of the mornings um, and afternoons. So, looking at can you decouple lab, lab visits to be the day before, those types of things. Um, shifting volume from Wednesday to any other day, so that typically is if new providers come on board. Um, looking at uh, solidifying our data capabilities, there's a lot of different things to. Really get a, a better measure of wait times, um, understanding how many times we're churning each of the chairs and kind of how. Uh, so, our infusion center is like one long bowling alley, unfortunately. So, um, it's just very long. So, our grandmates are walking many, many miles across the course of the day. Um, but, really looking at how we're assigning patients to chairs and if there's a way to optimize uh, utilization from that standpoint, because sometimes if we have two chairs left, the nurse who's next up is, you know, quarter a quarter block down the way, right? So now what do you do? So sometimes we run into we here, twenty thousand steps. So. We're, we're going to get some hoverboards, and uh, so uh, with the data we can we can optimize that a little better. Um, like I said, the, the huddles we, we're collecting a lot of information for that, so trying to figure out trends of issues that we see and really optimize, um, utilize that data. And then lastly, we're going to be applying this to other infusion centers, so our BMT infusion center, um, other community hospital, or college and 